What name could contain such a glory? In the cool breezes of Eden, brought from the infant earth, one arose, the voice of his creator speaking his identity to life. Adam, man. And as heaven waited short with breath, the creator spoke yet another, Eve mother of all the living. So it was with Abraham, named in the promise as the father of nations, Peter, the rock upon which the church would stand. The name called to life the destiny within. The name set the stage for all that was to come. And unto us a child was born. And what name could contain his glory? For he was mighty God, as the universe gasped into being flinging rays of light from his presence to pierce the void, to shatter the shadows to a tapestry of color. And he is mighty God, shattering our darkness, revealing our light, our truth in him. He was everlasting father when orphaned Israel needed a father's touch. When we, with grief-stricken cheeks, need the embrace of one who never leaves, when we have lost our way to dark horizons, it is our everlasting Father who lights the way home. He is Prince of Peace. When, like Elijah, we need the still small voice in the turmoil's midst. When, like David, we need the melodies of his presence to soothe our troubled minds. He is sanctuary within our trials, shepherd guiding us to still waters. And yes, he is wonderful counselor. God who gives counsel in the chaos, crafting disorder into calm and failure into beauty. He is a voice for the voiceless. He is dignity for the stateless soul. It is he who raised up a lowly shepherd to become a king. He who took the fishermen of Galilee and made them leaders of history. It is the counselor who redeems our lost years breaking chains that have kept dreams imprisoned and joy confined. The name reaches across eternity, exclaimed by the splendors of galaxies, sung by the passions of angels, roared in heaven's fervor, exalted in creation's unfettered rejoicing. What name could contain him? What title? What soul renowned? This is our wonderful counselor. This is our mighty God. This is our everlasting father, our prince of peace. What name could contain Emmanuel, God with us, Yahweh, the great I am. What name could contain the word of life, the light of the world, the king of kings, the Lord of all. We bow to the name that holds every other in its matchless worth. What name could contain such a glory? What name but Jesus? We cry Jesus. We cry holy is the name. And this is the gospel. This is the gospel, that Jesus is Lord and that he came to make all things right on this earth. And it began that night in Bethlehem, church. It began that night in Bethlehem when the God himself came down and became a baby. And because he did that and because he lived a sinless life and because he took our sins for us on the cross and came back to life again because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can be with the God who loves us. We can be with the God who loves us. But he will not force his love on anyone. He offers the free gift, but it's up, for us, it's up to us to decide if we are going to reach out and take that free gift of salvation that Jesus Christ offers to you and to me. And it's more than just about saying a prayer. But it's about humbling yourself before God in the recognition that you are absolutely doomed apart from him. You are absolutely doomed. It's called saving faith. 
saving faith in Jesus Christ. And saving faith in Jesus Christ is not intellectual knowledge about Jesus. And in the Bible Belt, there's a lot of people who know an awful lot about Jesus. There's a lot of people in the Bible Belt who were raised in the church and come to church on a regular basis and know all the facts about Jesus. But the difference is between here and here. That is the difference. That is the difference. Saving faith is not intellectual knowledge about Jesus. Saving faith is also not trusting God to help you with your daily needs or to help you with your problems. That's not saving faith. Saving faith is not trusting God to deliver you from COVID. That is not saving faith. I would liken saving faith to jumping out of an airplane from 35,000 feet. When you do this and you are in a free fall, there is one thing and one thing alone you put your trust in to save you, and that's your parachute. It's not your parachute plus you flapping your arms really hard. It's your parachute plus nothing. You place all your faith in that parachute because you know it is the only thing that is going to save your life. So when I say one must place saving faith in Jesus, you now understand my full meaning. Jesus is our parachute. Only through Jesus can we be saved. Only through Jesus. We have to place our entire faith and trust in him, knowing that without him, we are doomed to be eternally separate from God. That's a little preview. You weren't supposed to see that. <laughs> Everybody just take it easy. There's nothing to see here. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is my favorite gospel verse because it makes it so simple and so clear what one must do in order to become a Christian, as we like to call it, to become a Christ follower, to be saved by Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what the Bible tells us. Now, to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord is not to recite with your mouth Jesus is Lord. There's a difference between confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and reciting with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Anybody can say Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. See, I just said it. Anybody can say that. But to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord is to come before God with a heart that says, Lord God, I am going to place my entire life under the authority of your lordship. To confess with your mouth, Jesus Lord, is a heart's posture before God, that God, I want to bring every area of my life under your lordship. And when we do that, when that's our heart's posture before God, in that moment, we confess with our mouth, Jesus, you are Lord. And I believe, I believe that you came back to life again. Because without the resurrection, there is no salvation. When we do that, the Bible says you will be saved. And so the invitation to you, church, is simply this. If you have not come to the place where you have humbled yourself in a posture before God, a heart's posture before God, and declared him as your Lord, with the heart's desire to bring every area of your life under your Lord, his lordship, we invite you to do that this morning. We invite you to do that this morning. And if you have questions, you're just not sure. You're saying a bunch of stuff, Dave, that I, just, I don't know. I know there are countless Bible study teachers here. I know I'm here. I know my father's here. And we would, we would love to sit down and talk with you for as long as it takes. Because this right here is the greatest decision of your whole life. To place your saving faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Now, that being said. Here we go. Garfield, wake up. Good morning, John. No time for small talk, Garfield. It's Christmas morning, and you know what that means. Of course I do. Christmas means presents. Lots and lots of presents. Shoot your eye out, kid. Dear Santa Claus, how have you been? Did you have a nice summer? How is your wife? 
I have an extra good this year. So I have a long list of presents that I want. Oh, brother. Please note the size and color of each item and send as many as possible. If it seems too complicated, make it easy on yourself. Just send money. How about tens and twenties? Tens and twenties? Oh, even my baby sister. All I want is what I ha have coming to me. All I want is my fair share. Oh, that's good stuff. I, uh, I grew up as a child, and we all know Christmas is all about Jesus. So as a child for me growing up, the joy of Christmas was spending quiet reflection and meditation on the first coming of our Lord. Bull. <laughs> or as the great Dwight Schrute would say from the office, false. Uh, my, uh, as a child, the things we get excited about, the things we love, the things that we just can't wait to make us sleepless at night is what's under the tree. Because hear me, church, it's all about what's under the tree. And I tell you what, as a kid, I would grow up and I'm a little high strung. Again, this is a long running joke. You guys know that about me already. I'm a little high strung. I deal with anxiety and sometimes nervous excitement, if you will. I deal with that. And so you can imagine for me at Christmas, when Christmas time rolls around, I would get, get so worked up about what was under that tree. I would get so worked up to the point that I would beg my parents, can we please open just one present early? Just one. Can we please, just, just one present and my dad, my dad would be like, you know, well, if you can stand on your head in the corner there, okay, I'll let you open a, 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 you know, a present. So I would try to, you know, and then he would say, man, you look silly. That's the joy of my Christmas. I remember growing up, and, and what was really funny about it is, is, my, is my, uh, uh, my sister and I, we would get so excited. But then when I would say, hey, can we open a present? Can we open a present? And, and my mom and dad were like, mm, should we open a present? They would look at Sarah and she'd go, oh, I think we should wait till Christmas. And it just, it let the air out of my tires. And you would think, church, you would think, in all honesty, you would think that as I got older, it would die down. As I got older, I got smarter, though. It becomes real easy to tell what's under that tree based on the shape of the box. I was smart. There was one year I guessed every single one of my presents underneath that tree. And after that, mom and dad started putting gag gifts under the tree. Stuff that was not real presents, like rocks. Dad's underwear. <laughs> you can imagine my face on Christmas morning. <laughs> it's crazy. It was crazy. And then I got older still, and uh, we moved to Texas. And when we moved to Texas, uh, we first lived in a duplex that was over here. Actually, I drove by it the other day on Metter Lane. Metter Lane, over here in Burleson, close, close to Norwood Elementary, so the little duplex we moved into. We rolled in in 1984. We stayed a little bit at a Motel 6. Then we ended up over here on Metter Lane in this little tiny duplex. When Dad was first starting to go to seminary, I was in sixth grade. And uh, uh, we finally moved out of that duplex into a trailer that was over here. And it was during the Christmas season that we moved. And so, you know, I knew already Mom had done the Christmas shopping. And my presents were somewhere in those boxes on that move. And there was a thing I wanted so bad, y'all. Now, you got to wrap your heads around how cool this was. It was a Bigfoot uh, monster truck with little gears on the top of it that gave you four-wheel drive. It was the coolest thing ever, and I just wanted this monster truck so, so badly. And so sure enough, I, we were moving the boxes, and I noticed there was one box that was taped up, and the rest weren't. And so I opened that box, and the first thing I saw was that Bigfoot truck. And then my parents found out that I saw. And you would think that, but no. They did not take it back. They did not take it back. Um, actually, uh, they did something worse. Mom just said, okay, you know what you're getting for Christmas, and now you have to wait for it which was just like the worst. And so I remember waiting and waiting and waiting because, again, as a child, it's about what's under that tree. It's about what's under that tree. And then I got really older, and I got a job. And I love giving, y'all. That gives my heart a lot of joy. I love giving to people. I just enjoy it. It's, it's a lot of fun. I know some of you know what I'm talking about. You're in the same kind of boat. Your heart, that's just who you are. That's just who you are. And I remember when I got a job and I was able to buy nice gifts from my parents for the first time. 
You know, not just, you know, like a little something here, but, but a nice gift. And I remember one Christmas in particular, I got my dad, and this was in the early 2000s, just roll with me, but he had this 24-inch color TV, and I got him, y'all, a 31-inch. 31, yeah. A 31-inch cathode ray tube television with a DVD player. It's big stuff. And a friend of mine whose name was Terry Carrington, he went to our church a long time ago, Terry Carrington, volunteered to pick this thing up at Best Buy for me and bring it to my parents' house because we always would spend the night over there on Christmas Eve back in the day. And so he brought it over there, and when my mom and dad went to bed, me and my brother-in-law, Andy, we got that big thing into the house. We got that thing set up. So when mom and dad woke up and walked into the living room, the first thing they would see would be that television. And I went to bed that night, and I did not sleep at all. <laughs> to the point that 4.35 in the morning, I heard mom start to get up, and I thought to myself, oh, I bet she's going to see the TV. I don't want to miss this. So I thought I would be sneaky and crawl. I'm a 20-some-odd-year-old man. <laughs> crawl down the hall where she can't see me so I get a peek to see if she saw the new TV and the new DVD player. What I did not count on was the miniature Schnauzer Max that lived with my parents who had a little bit of a temper. <laughs> and when he saw me in the hallway, he was like, ah, and I was like, ah, 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 like that. It was the most awkward thing ever. Mom was like, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, nothing. And the gig was up. And the gig was up. And, uh, and then things started to change. I moved into an apartment. Soon I got married. And I couldn't give as much. When the things that we love the most about Christmas are taken away, what are we left with? The things we love most about Christmas. And there's a lot of things we love most about Christmas. I love giving gifts. I love receiving gifts. Praise the Lord. I love, I love that experience. But I'll tell you right now, looking back on my childhood, looking back on my childhood, uh, I don't remember hardly anything of, of what I got. I don't remember hardly anything of what I got. And I, I, it's funny, I, I kind of I got ahead of myself here a little bit, but, but yeah. But I'll tell you what I remember. i tell you what I remember. I remember how much my parents loved us. I remember how much our parents loved us. I don't remember, like if you told me if I could to tell you what I got for Christmas all the years, I don't remember. But I remembered how much our parents loved us. And that's one of the great things about giving gifts at Christmas time, church. That's one of the great things about giving gifts at Christmas time. Uh, because we get to show our love to each other. And that's what God did for us when He sent Jesus. And that's one of the things I love about Christmas is giving gifts and receiving gifts and having that special, special time with, with family. But again, uh, Christmas is a celebration of Jesus Christ. And so one of the ways we celebrate is in how we give to each other. And I love it. But what happens when that's taken away? Or what happens when you can't give as much? What happens when you can't see your family? And I know we're all in that boat this year, aren't we? Some of the things we love most about Christmas are not the same this year. But Christmas is a celebration of Jesus Christ. It's his birthday party. Now, when you throw a birthday party for somebody, you celebrate them, right? That's who we celebrate. We celebrate Jesus. Now, if my son had a birthday and I said, son, I'm going to give you a birthday party. And he was like, great, and we're going to invite a bunch of people. And he said, great. And then he got there, and he walked into the living room for his birthday party, and I invited a whole bunch of senior adults he did not know. <laughs> He'd be like, what, what is this? And then I gave him a birthday present, like a Barbie doll. Happy birthday, son. And he's like, I, do, I don't even know what I would want to do with this. And then I came out singing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you with candles stuck inside a bunch of pieces of broccoli. Happy birthday to you. 
And you know what my son would probably say? He'd probably say, hold, Dad, I, my birthday is supposed to be about me. My birthday is supposed to be a, about me, right? Christmas is by definition a celebration of Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is. That's what Christmas is. And so we at Christmas celebrate Christmas by expressing our love to Jesus. So how do we show our love for our Savior at Christmas? Well, Jesus makes it pretty clear. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, in John 14, 15, you will keep, you will keep my commandments. And then he goes further still. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And the verse we're going to look at now is actually a verse that has been used a lot in a sort of social justice sort of sense. It's like about how important it is to take care of the poor all over the world and, and, and do that. But I, I want to read this to you. We're going to study it for just a little bit. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick. I was in prison and you visited me. But then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And here's the kicker, church. And the king will answer him, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So this verse, Jesus is talking to people and he's saying that when you care for the poor, and when you take care of those who have need, you're doing it to Jesus. But I want to be real clear about something. A lot of times when we read this verse, and I know we've used it for a lot of mission trips where we go out and bless the poor all over, all over our community and all that kind of stuff, it's fantastic. It applies, certainly. But I want to draw your attention to the phrase, my brothers. You see that? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers... You did it to me, my brothers. Now, Jesus wasn't talking about his literal, like, James. He wasn't talking about his physical brothers in this moment. So who was Jesus talk about when he says his brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So when we get to 1 John... And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? This is hardcore, y'all. This is serious business. This is John the Baptist talking. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. That is to say, church, bear fruits that show that you have brought every area of your life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Now, when we think of the word fruit... A lot of times, especially for those of you who grew up with me in children's ministry, when we think of the word fruit, the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I got five girls who do the motions with me. It makes me happy. <laughs> because if y'all had not done that, I would have looked really stupid up here. So I appreciate that. You saved me. Well done. But yeah, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. Now, these are all very real things that manifest themselves, these attributes of the Spirit, in very real ways in our lives. They manifest themselves in very real, in very real ways. Uh, but these are all abstract terms. Love, joy, peace, patience, they're abstract. What John the Baptist is doing is he's taking the word fruit and putting it into concrete, measurable terms. And when God's word puts things in concrete, measurable terms, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I get a little uncomfortable. Because what the scripture tells us is that if you are to have two shirts, you should give to the one who doesn't have none, who has none. I love giving gifts at Christmas time. I love it. And you should too. And showing love to one another in this way. It's Christ-like to show love to one another at Christmas. It's Christ-like. But is it possible in a culture where materialism runs so rampant, is it possible that in our celebration over here and loving each other over here and enjoying all the good things over here that we look at another brother or sister in Christ over here and kind of go, well, I got it. No. That's antichrist. And what makes me nervous, as, and I've dealt with this, you asked my father, I've dealt with this for years, is Christmas, when we celebrate Christmas, that we give and we give and we do all the stuff and it's all great and there's people over here in need and we say, no. And our Christmas, which we do in the name of Jesus, when we turn away from those in need in our own body, which is what these verses are talking about it's specifically, that our Christmas celebrations become antichrist, even though we do it in the name of Jesus. Are you with me? Again, I love giving gifts. I love receiving gifts. I love the joy that comes from it. I'm looking forward to it this year, and you should too. But we have a responsibility to take care of one another, church. I love this verse, Galatians 6. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, check it out, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. Because here's the deal, y'all. This is part of our witness, and it's a huge part of our witness. How we take care of one each other in the church. By the way, let me just commend you, Reese Prairie. I have never in my life been a part of a church body. Actually, I've never been in my life a part of any other church body, I don't think. <laughs> so this compliment may not mean much, actually. But nevertheless, the thing I am constantly impressed with you guys on is how well you take care of each other. Can I just say that to you? I mean, I watch you guys care for each other in a way that just blesses my heart. You know what I'm saying? As a pastor. And so well done to you. Well done to you on that. But these verses talk about very specifically that our witness, that the, the, a huge aspect of our witness is how we care for one another in the body of Christ, especially to those who are in the household of faith. Because check it out. Uh, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Right? Christmas is very much a celebration of Jesus Christ. That's who we celebrate. So let's talk about what's at the core of this. If you find yourself in that place going, oh gosh, you know what? I, I'm doing all this, but I know of people in, are in need, and oh man, and, and you're, in your heart of hearts, what, what's at the core of this, of this issue for you and for me? Well, actually, it's in Luke uh, chapter 12. And Jesus said to them, take care. And be on your guard against all covetousness. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, Jesus says this first right before he goes into a parable. As far as I can tell, this is the only teaching that Jesus gives where a man does something so evil that God says you deserve to die right now. As far as I can tell, this is the only time in the whole of the Gospels and all of Jesus' teachings where a man does something so evil 
evil, and repulsive. God says, you deserve to die right now. And what the man does is he's blessed with an abundance of a harvest. And his answer to this is not to give to those in need. Rather, to build bigger barns for himself and to hoard those things and to be greedy. The issue is not that he was rich. That is not the issue. There is no sin in being wealthy. Matter of fact, I can point you to a few people in the Old Testament, Abraham being one of them. Abraham in Genesis, if you read, Abraham was probably one of the richest guys in the Old Testament under King Solomon and maybe Job. That guy was loaded, man. He had a lot. And I can tell you that Abraham was willing to give it all up if God asked him to. And you know how I know that? Because he was willing to give up Isaac. He was willing to give up Isaac, his only son that he had waited for for so long. And God said, I want you to put him on an altar. And Abraham said, okay. If he's willing to give up Isaac, you know he'd be willing to give up anything else that God asked him to. No question. No question. Because see, it's all about, it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart, right? It's all about our attitude towards the stuff. It's all about how we look at it. It has nothing to do with how much you have or how little you have. I want to be really clear about this. This sermon has nothing to do with how much or how, or how little you have under your tree. This sermon has nothing to do with that. It has absolutely everything to do with our heart towards these things. There's nothing wrong with having. There is something very sinful and evil about hoarding. And here's the definition. I think it's wise to have a savings account. I think it's wise to prepare for your future. I happen to believe that. We saved for a long time, and I got really sick with E. coli, and then I got a disc, a bulging disc in my back. It's awesome because I'm old. <laughs> er, old er. And we had medical bills come in because it got so bad one night. It was so bad I had to go to the ER. How much fun is that? And you know how reasonably priced they are. And so those bills came in. But I had the money to pay for those things because, okay, I, I, I saved towards those things. But here's the deal. It's smart to save. It's smart to prepare for the future. But here's the deal. The minute my savings account becomes off limits to God, and I say, no, this is not, this is for my rainy day or whatever, that's when having becomes hoarding. Because what I tell you, church, it's all about what's under the tree. And I want to turn this phrase a little bit. What if we viewed this tree as the lordship of Jesus Christ? Because that's what I'm challenging you to do. I'm challenging you to pray and to seek and to bring every area of your life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And as the spirit leads you, do it. That's what I'm asking you to do. This is not a measurable thing. This is not a, how much do you have under the tree? Or how little? Or how much did you give to somebody else? La, la, la. I don't want to know. That's a crown you get to lay at the feet of Jesus. I don't want to know. That's the joy for you in serving Jesus. This is how we express our love for Jesus at Christmas time. It's all about Jesus. And Jesus had a love for taking care of people. Right? And so we bring every area of our life under the lordship of Jesus Christ because Church, it's all about what's under the tree. And it is all about lordship, which begins, as we talked about earlier, when you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That starts a journey with you. You are sealed till the day of redemption. You are a child of the king. When you bring every area of your life and you, in, with that heart's posture, I'm bringing every area of my life under your lordship. And that is a posture that will continue for the rest of your life. And you will stumble and you will fall. It will happen. But the spirit is in us. He's working in us. And that still small voice you might be hearing this morning is a, is a beautiful thing. Because it's evidence, once again, that the Lord is not done with you yet. He's never done with you. He's never done with me. Ever. I want to end our time talking about shepherds and kings. I want to end our time this morning talking about shepherds and, and kings. And behold, the star the Magi had seen when it rose went before them, and it came to rest 
over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It was the first baby shower, and I can guarantee you, it was boring. Because, come on. But nevertheless, I bet Joseph got pretty excited. Especially when they brought out the gold. I'm sure he was thrilled. So, these are the kings. They come rich, and they come bringing what they have to worship the king. Right? And then we get to this passage in Luke chapter 2, 8 through 16. And what it talks about is the shepherds that are in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, today I bring you news of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and the shepherds ran to see what God had just revealed to them. They ran to see it. And they fell, and they worshipped him. And they brought nothing except their B.O. Because you know shepherds, holy moly. They had nothing to give but the worship. But their worship. You've got kings who ride in magisterially and give what they have. You've got shepherds who run desperately to get to Jesus and have nothing and offer their worship. The kings gave as they were able. The shepherds gave as they were able. Some Christmases, we approach the manger like kings. And we have to give. And there's other Christmases, perhaps like this year, where we approach low. And we feel like maybe we have nothing to offer. We feel low. But I ask you this, church, between the two groups, the kings and the shepherds, who got the greater revelation from God? Who saw God's glory shine the brightest? When we're low, that's when God's glory can shine the brightest in our lives. And so this is my blessing for you. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Let's pray. God, you're good, and God, you're right. And Lord, as a church, we long to bring every area of our lives under the tree, under your lordship. This Christmas, God, I pray your spirit would be on us. I pray your glory would shine on us. For those who cannot be with family this year, and they miss their family, and they long to be with family, I pray your glory would shine on them, particularly, God, the brightest that they would see your goodness in ways they never thought possible this Christmas. Lord, for those of us, as we deal with the tension between having and hoarding, between using what we have to take care of others while loving and, and blessing each other at Christmas time, God, I pray you would lead us, that you would direct us, that we would listen to you, and that we would obey. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, church.